Hey, by the way, my name is Eric Bucci, and I'm the lead pastor here at Cornerstone Church. And if this is your first time coming to Cornerstone, hey, thank you so much for being here today. If you're watching online for the first time, I just want to let you know something really, really important is that God loves you so much that you, he has a purpose, he has a plan for your life. You're not an accident, you're, you're on purpose. God has you here on purpose, and we just want to let you know how much God loves you. Can you welcome everyone that's watching online and everyone that's here? Nice and loud, come on. Amen. Well, we had a great time yesterday. I want to thank Cornerstone. We were able to feed over five, uh, we provided five, over 500 meals for people over this Thanksgiving. You can go ahead, yes. And uh, I want to thank Danny. Is Danny here today? I don't see where Danny, there is Danny. Can stand up, Danny. Thank you for all the hard work. Come on. I appreciate all the hard work, Danny. You really do. And uh, just a great job helping to organize all that. And everyone else that was involved, we had a lot of fun. And uh, we were able to make a difference together. So that's really encouraging that we're able to do that. And so thank you, everybody. Also, I want to thank everyone for the generosity towards Haiti last week. We wanted to uh, take an offer for Dr. Franco to get that four-wheel drive, that little mini, mini four-wheel drive in the mountains so they can bring the water to the children that are escaped to the mountains because of the gangs. And uh, if you were not here last week, it, what's going on in Haiti is incredible. Uh, perhaps the most difficult thing that's happened in the last 60 years or more. And, uh, and so we want to be able to help that. I think we're up to 7,000 or something like that, a couple of grand more, and we're going to be able to do it. And we're going to do it regardless, but we would love to have you participate with that. And uh, if you want to do that, just put Haiti an extra, that'd be fantastic. All right, everybody? So uh, let's get ready to study the Word of God today. If you want to go ahead and get your Bibles open or your pads or whatever, we're going to be looking at the Beatitudes today. So let's go ahead and open our Bibles as I get a drink. All right. Well, we're excited. We're talking about this, the Beatitudes, attitudes that elevate. And a lot of people would say this, and we didn't, our, our basic theme is this. Your attitude determines your altitude. You've heard it a lot, right? And all the self-help stuff. And it's true. Your attitude does determine your altitude inside. But you can be happy and self-adjusted and do really, really well in your own life and feel like everything is fine. It does not mean it's fine just because your internal reality believes it that way. Correct? All right. So what we want to do is not just get our attitudes better. That's not good enough. What we want to do is match our attitudes with God's beatitudes, which will take us to God's altitude. And God's altitude, my friends, is out of this world. And the only way you're going to overcome and, and be able to do more in this world is to be out of this world, and that's through Jesus Christ. And these beatitudes are amazing. They're a preamble to the Sermon on the Mount. It is an incredible shifter of everything. I mean, when you read this list, we're going to lead it in a few moments, it goes against everything we would naturally want. In fact, it goes to the very things you and I don't want and tells us we are to be those things in some instances. And so we'll be talking about that today. So the Beatitudes, attitudes that elevate. But I want to start off with this. <laughs> I appreciate the help there. Can you come next service too? I love it. Don't like a child, right? Well, they, they have a dog, and I, I, when I think about hunger, I, I really think about dogs, because dogs have an insatiable appetite. You ever see a dog? I mean, no matter where you are, they just, I mean, they just want to eat more and more and more. In fact, when, we, when I was a kid, a few years ago, we had this dog. It was a mutt. It was called Heidi. And uh, this, this dog my parents had, they, away, they gave it away to my grandparents. We were devastated over it. I'm still going for counseling over it. But this dog never stopped eating. I've never seen a dog like Heidi. Most dogs, they eat. Now, this dog would eat itself to death. In fact, it, 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 would eat, it would continue to eat until it started vomiting, and then it would eat again. It was like a Greek or a Roman. I mean, it was insane. I'm seriously. So we literally had to get food away from this dog because this dog would eat and eat and eat and eat. And I asked the vet, and the dog would probably explode. So we'd always eat constantly. We were like, what's the deal? It's like a teenager, right? You can get eating and eating and eating. And, and, and so it had an insatiable appetite. And you know what I would say to us today? That's the kind of appetite God wants to give us for him. An appetite that constantly goes after him. An appetite that is always finding satisfaction, yet is always growing and wanting more. And so let's make no mistake that all of us have appetites. Our appetites rule our lives, right? When you're tired, you go to sleep, hopefully. When you're hungry, you eat, right? So our appetites, well, if we're not careful, 
can control our lives to such a degree that we let our appetites do that and where we stop living the life we're called to live. So today we're going to look at that today. And I want to remind everybody that there's an appetite that God has put into your heart and my heart. It's found here in Ecclesiastes. He's made everything beautiful in its time. Also, he has put eternity in their hearts, except that no one can find out the work that God has d- does from the beginning to the end. He's put eternity in your hearts. And what that is, is God has put an insatiable appetite, appetite for things out of this world. He's given us an appetite that this world, frankly, cannot satisfy. And many of us will never reach our goals, so we have this perpetual carrot in front of us called materialism, right? The advertising agencies that are out there that that are constantly putting things in your browser or on your phone or the people that call you up and say your warranty's run out. (laughs) I get about five or six a week. How many, am I the only one? We need to have a lawsuit against those people. Sue them so we can build something extra in the church. But anyhow, uh, but this is what begins to happen. We had this appetite, and, and we want to have this appetite. We can run after the world. There are people that have, have climbed the highest mountain, and when they got there, they're like, isn't there more than this? And my friends, if we're not careful, we can start chasing after things, and we're never going to be satisfied. And so he's made everything beautiful in his time, and he's put eternity in our hearts. My friends, everyone knows there's more. Even atheists know there's more. You think about Elon Musk, who wants to save the planet, right? He wants us to go to Mars. He doesn't even believe in God, from what I understand. And so he's trying to expand, and he knows there's something more. Why would you want to leave this earth and go to Mars? I mean, the candy bar is okay, but I don't want to go to Mars, right? But he knows there's something more, and he wants it. Why? Because God has put that hunger in us, and we deny that truth. I pray that Elon Musk comes to know Jesus Christ. Father, let him come to know you in Jesus' name. You know, and think about it. So we have this hunger and thirst for righteousness, so we're supposed to have. And so today we're going to look at this. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Just wanted to reiterate just a few moments what this is all about. This is called the Beatitudes. And this is what God wants us to do. He wants us to hunger and thirst for righteousness. And when you look about this and you read about it, it has a tremendous meaning in it. So I want to go ahead just for a few moments. I want us to read uh, the Beatitudes once again so you understand the context of it. There are these statements that Christ says. But today we're going to look at what this means. But first, before we do that, let's look it through it quickly. Okay, this is what happened. Jesus was speaking on a mountain, or not a mount, by the Sea of Galilee. And he, this is what happened. And seeing the multitude, he went up on a mountain, and when he was seated, his disciples came to him. Then he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, his disciples came up higher to hear him speak. He began to speak. Other people began to come, and he began to give one of the greatest sermons we've ever heard. Blessed, he says, are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. And remember, we talked about the very first week, what it means to be blessed. Blessed, actually, comes from the Greek word of an island in the Mediterranean where everything you need is there. It's like going to one, all those inclusive, ever go to those places, all inclusive? Everything you need is in the resort. That's blessed or happy, right? Blessed, blessed, you will be full. You will have everything you need. Blessed are the poor in spirit it doesn't make any sense and so we talked the first week basically that we have to that we have to live day by day like a beggar always needing more now why would god want us to be a pauper no we have to rely on god that much and that people that have it all together do not have it together that someone who's poor and has no money has a better concept of the kingdom of heaven than someone who's real successful and thinks they need nothing But we talked about that, having a poverty spirit for God. I'm needing God. I need him that bad, right? For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn. Who who wants to mourn, right? For they shall be comforted. And in this world, you're going to have trouble, everybody. And if you try not to mourn, you'll mourn more, more. If you try to be happy all the time, you'll be more unhappy. And so embracing mourning, understanding that, understanding that you're poor in spirit, understanding you're mourning, that you need God, coming to the place and point where you're at complete poverty and knowing you need God completely. That's a good place to be. In fact, we've seen people go through drug rehab centers 
And uh, before they go there, I'll have a friend of mine that, can you talk to this person? They're struggling with alcohol and drugs, and I know you got through it. And come back and say, he's not ready yet. Why? No, he's not broken enough. You got to come to the point where you're powerless. You have to come to the point where you realize you have nothing else to give. That's the moment you can truly get help in the kingdom of heaven. So blessed are those who mourn, for theirs shall be the kingdom of heaven. We mentioned last time we were together, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. I mean, that's just so counterintuitive. We talked about that last time, being gentle, okay? Let's just go on for, for a few moments. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, that's today, for they shall be filled. We go next to come, get, come together. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. I'm looking forward to that one, by the way. Uh, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my name's sake. Rejoice, now this is the point that's important. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad. I mean, who wants to be persecuted? Who wants all these negative things to happen, right? For great is your reward on earth. What does it say? In heaven, for they persecuted the prophets who were before you. So listen, everybody, nothing makes sense in this Beatitudes. In fact, nothing makes sense in earth until you understand we're not created just for this earth. We're created for eternity. Unless you understand that, you're never going to get this life correct. Anyone that talks about the here and now only is missing the point. Let me give you an illustration I heard a, a number of years ago. If I shared it before, uh, get over it. I'm a little older now, so I do repeat myself. But I, I remember hearing an illustration a number of years ago. Imagine, if you will, that uh, we were going to board an airplane. And I told you, hey, look at this great parachute here. I want you to put it on. Buy this from me. I don't want that. What? It's going to make your life amazing. You're going to find such satisfaction. You're going to have happiness. Your wife, if you're married, is going to love you more. Your husband, if you're married, is going to love you more. Are you going to find your husband or wife? You're going to get out of debt. You're going to feel so happy. You're going to have your best life now like you've never dreamed of happening. But put this backpack on. It's going to make your life better. So you're like, great. So you put the backpack on. You get on the plane. And they put you in coach, which is about the size of a roach. You're sitting there like this, right? And you get the backpack, and, and you're in the middle seat. Don't you love when you get the middle seat? Yeah. And so you're in between two people that have extra, uh, let's just say they have extra baggage on them. Anyhow, so you're sitting there like this, and, and they're all happy, and they're having a good time. And you're like, and you're like well, I thought this makes my life better. It I makes the flight better. My flight's worse. Look how comfortable. And look at the people in first class. Have you seen the purple people in first class? And you're sitting there like this. This is terrible. Funny, you know what? I don't believe it. after an hour or two in the flight, you're going to fly all the way to Hawaii. And so you take that thing off and say, I don't need this anymore. And you get rid of it until the plane is going to go down. Now you need a parachute, right? Well, the reason you have a parachute, everybody, is not to make you more comfortable in the plane, although it does do that. It's to save you from impending doom if the airplane goes down or if you jump out of the airplane, right? That's the purpose of it. My friends, if we think that all salvation is, is to have a good life now and, and have a better marriage if you're not married or get rid of your spouse who's a louse, I don't know, but you want to do better. You want to go have a better job, a better health, live in a better house. Right? I want to have happiness. I want to do this or the other. And if you think that's what Jesus is here for, you're mistaken. It's like that person on an airplane that wears a big backpack that has the wrong perspective. However, if you go out on a plane, and you say, where's a 30% chance that the plane might go down, how happy will you be to have that parachute? You'll be fine with it being uncomfortable because why? There's a greater purpose beyond what you're experiencing. My friends, the only way we're going to understand this earth is that we're created beyond this earth, that Jesus has come ultimately to save us. And will we have a happier life? Yes, because we know the big picture. We mentioned last time we were together that, that my children like to watch ball games live. They don't want it on TiVo or Diva, whatever it's called. They want to see it live because if they know what happens, it loses the intensity. Listen, everybody, the intensity of suffering has been decreased significantly because we win in Jesus Christ. Right? So, 
We have to get our eyes off of this earth onto heaven. If you don't understand that, I believe we're coming to days and upon our land, we're going to be persecuted for our faith. And until we have ourselves lined up, you're going to fall away. Talk to people in other countries. Talk to the lovely family that came from Iran and who had who are refugees. They understand what I'm talking about. Talk to people in Haiti right now. Talk to people in North Korea. They understand what we're talking about, everybody. We have to get our life aligned. Does God want us to have a good life? Yes, but what good is it if we don't see the long view? Now, can I repeat myself again because I'm older? You're supposed to give me more grace because I repeat stories. Okay, the, the good news is I haven't forgot that I told you before. So <laughs> I'm in good shape. All right, but this is such a good illustration, I can't think of anything better. But I remember a friend of mine that was into martial arts. As you can tell, I'm also very high trained in the, in the arts. Anyhow, so uh, he, one day he was showing me how he breaks boards. It was a lot of fun, you know. Oh, that's great. He had three or four boards. He'd crack them and he'd kick them. And he said, why don't you try? Really? Yeah. Okay, I tried. Boom, I couldn't do it. I kept trying to break that board. I couldn't do it. I said, how do you do it? You're just a little skinny guy. Well, I should have said that. He beat me up afterwards. But anyhow, so he said, look, the problem is your focus is wrong. You're looking at the board. It's almost like the Matrix. See the spoons. Anyhow, he says, I want you to try to hit my sternum. I want you to try to punch to my chest with your, with, your, with your palm. So that's exactly what I did. I looked at his chest, tried to hit his sternum. Guess what happened? I broke the boards. So don't mess with me. I know how to do it now. <laughs> but the, the, the reason I could break through is I was looking to where I, looking beyond to where that board was. If you're looking to the board of this world, you're never going to ultimately break it. You must look to heaven. That is our final home. My friends, I say it every week, and you're sick of it, good. I hope it comes out of you every time you see me. What do I always say every single week? The best days are always ahead for those in Christ Jesus, right? Because we are made for eternity. You have to get that. Everything on this planet says now. Everything on this planet says eat now, pay later. Play now, pay later, right? And the kingdom of God says I've already paid the bill. So, Jesus says, great will be your reward in heaven, for they persecuted the prophets who were before you. We have to get that before us, everybody. And it takes work. Why? Because everything around us and about, we have appetites everywhere, don't we? Our hungers drive us. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Now, we don't understand hunger too much in our country. The fact that we have to worry about our weight shows how blessed we are. There are areas in the country they can't gain weight because they can't get enough food. In fact, when they wrote this, when Jesus sp spoke this out back in the days of Jesus, they didn't have refrigeration. They had to go out daily and get their food. They might salt their meats or put them on the ground or something like that, but they had to go out daily to get their food, and hunger was a common occurrence in the time of Jesus. A lot of people died from malnutrition in Jesus' day. So when Jesus said hunger, the word there, hunger, is not just a little bit. It means you're famished. It means you're so hungry, you can barely move forward. And so, in fact, I was reading about fasting, and, 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 I, and I've done some in the past, and, and sometimes you fast the first couple of days, you're really, really hungry, the week goes by, all of a sudden, the second week, you start feeling, hey, I can kind of do this, this is not that bad. The third week goes by, and when you get close to that 40-day mark, about 37, 38, according to what I've read in testimonies, your body goes into the survival mode. And all of a sudden, that switch of hunger comes on like you've never experienced before because your body starts consuming its own muscle mass. It starts consuming everything. It's screaming out to you, eat something or you'll die. You better eat now. And that's what we're talking about. And that's the kind of, by the way, when you read the Bible, and I, forgive me for using this, but you're never going to forget it. When the Bible says that the, the uh, city was under siege and the people ate their own children, you're like, how on earth could that happen? That's the kind of hunger. It gets that bad. I know the Bible, by the way, the Bible's rated NR. I mean, it's bad. I mean, stuff that happened in the scriptures, the hunger is that bad. Well, you have to eat 
or you die. If I put your head underneath the water and I don't let you up, what's going to happen? You're going to do everything you can to breathe that air. That's the kind of hunger we're talking about here. And when Jesus says, blessed are those who hunger, he's saying that have this ravenous appetite for what? Blessed are those who hunger and thirst. Where you're so thirsty, you, you can barely move forward. You're going to die unless you get something to drink. For righteousness. Oh, great. I knew I hated church for that reason. Righteousness sounds boring. What's righteousness for? Well, we're talking about an insatiable appetite that you have to have it. And righteousness, by the way, you know what? Right? How many people like things right? Right? Come on, even Goldilocks likes it right. Too hot, too, too soft, just, what did she say? It's just right. See, she wanted a righteous mattress. She wanted a righteous porridge. Okay, so there's nothing wrong. You see, that's why all of us know there's something more. This is not righteous enough. Righteous is the right thing. Righteousness means the rightness of God in your life. Do you not want the rightness of God in your relationships? Yes, I do. Do you not want the righteousness in your body, the righteousness in the church? Of course, right? So blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled, which doesn't make a lot of sense. So we're talking about perpetual hunger. We're talking about this. Imagine my dog Heidi again. Uh, God bless her soul. I don't know where she is. If you think they're in heaven. Oh, okay, they're in heaven. We'll get to that next week. So, I mean, she would eat and eat and eat and eat and eat. And this is the good news. What the kingdom of God is, is that you hunger and thirst for Christ. While you're eating, you're being satisfied, but your appetite is getting greater for more. So it's not like you're famished and weak and puny. No, you're, you're expanding. I was just talking to Joe and, and Stephanie who uh, do an amazing job with our youth right now. And, and he talked about these little, he has these chickens in the backyard. It's kind of funny to hear him talk about it. It's hilarious actually. He says these little chickadees are a little born. They're a little born. He said all they do is they eat, they go over here to sleep, get up, eat. And within a week they grow like three times their size. And that's what we're called to do. Not eat and sleep. <laughs> How many could say amen to that, right? But it's constantly eating and growing in God, and eating and growing in God, and being satisfied. That's why the Apostle Paul says, I learn to be content in all things, but I want more. And so this is an invitation, everybody, for us to grow. Now listen, for lesser are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. So, here's the good news, everybody. Righteousness, I can't do it, neither can you. I don't care how hard you try. In fact, I want to help you understand today that if you, I pray that when you come to Cornerstone Church, that you'll never be satisfied with this church. I pray you're never satisfied with my preaching. I pray you're never satisfied with the worship. Doesn't mean I want you to go to a different church, but I want you to have the right perspective. Who's the one that satisfies? Christ. Christ. I pray that when you come here, it's like watching the Food Network when you have no food in the refrigerator. And I pray that we're showing you these incredible scrumptious spiritual meals that are ready for you and that you have an appetite to go and begin to prepare these meals with the Lord and grow in him. That's the purpose of Cornerstone Church. Not to, this church is not your answer. Christ is the answer. No pastor is your answer. I don't care how cool or uncool they are. It's not about that. It's about Christ. And the church is a community of people that should be walking close to God, getting a hunger, and helping us to connect to God. The moment this church stops you from wanting to connect to Christ is the time it's time to leave. And I'll leave with you. Because it's not about Cornerstone. It's about Jesus. And I pray that you're hungrier by the worship. I pray that you want more because you want to get closer to God. Not that you can come more to church. It's not church that saves you. It's Christ that saves you. We got to tell some people, go home. You hear too much. My wife tells me that every day. You know. Just kidding. But this is the good news, everybody. Here, you can't earn your righteousness. I don't care how hard. This is what the truth. You are righteous in Christ. So, what we're talking about here, you're righteous in position, but we're not righteous in practice. Do you understand? 
We're righteous in position in Christ, but the practice is not there. When we find right, we're already righteous in Christ, but when we begin to do the practice, we become better in Christ. We become fuller. We become more efficient in Christ. We experience more of his presence. Is that not a good thing? So please, do not misunderstand. This is not about rules and regulations. This is about relationship and trusting God in that relationship to experience the fullness of Christ. Here's the good news, and it's really good news, because you're not good enough and I'm not good enough, for he made him, that's Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin for us that we might become, we might become, what? The righteousness of God by working hard in church and by reading the Bible and praying and being part of a small group and handing out food and a, and a, and a clothing drives. That's how you, no, is that what it says, everybody? What does it say? What does it say? I want to hear you say it. And who? One more time. In him, notice that, the righteousness of God comes from only one, in Christ, not religion, not cornerstone, not any church. And maybe your background is, you were never good enough. Welcome to Cornerstone. None of us are good enough. Maybe you've been disappointed by your teachers or nuns or whatever, that you grew up in a Catholic school and nothing wrong with Catholic schools. Maybe you went to a church where you're never doing enough for God. Guess what? Christ does it all. I'm preaching a whole lot better than you're amening. Seriously, this is good news. So we're the righteousness of God. So listen, everybody. We don't, be, we don't do these beatitudes to earn God's favor. You can't earn God's favor. Only through Jesus can you earn his favor. Amen. Do you understand what help you catch what I'm saying? It's so important. So you are the righteousness. You are righteous in Christ. Here's another truth. What you hunger and thirst for drives your life. It does. It drives you physically. Maslow's hierarchy of needs. You know what that's all about? I need food, I need shelter, right? The, the higher you get, the more of these basic needs of your body are satisfied, the more opportunity you have to spend on other pursuits. And in America, we're so blessed that we don't have to worry primarily about food and water and shelter, most of us. So we have these other pursuits. And so what you hunger for and thirst for drives your life. And so what's driving your life? I want to be liked by people. I want to have the biggest church in our district. I, I want to have this or the other, and I want to do this. And that's what drives your life. And so what, you're always in competition with somebody else. and always feel like you're not good enough or you're better than somebody else. Who wants to live that life? I want to hunger and thirst for something that's beyond this earth. And so whatever you're hunger and thirst for, what are you hungering and thirsting for? You know, when I, was like, when I was a kid, my mom used to tell me all the time, and now I'm saying, telling my kids this, there's certain phrases that you say as a parent that's like in the DNA. And one of the sta statements we always tell our children, and you've all said it before, if your friends jump off a bridge, <laughs> what, let me hear you say it. Will you? No, of course not, right? Here's another one. Don't eat before dinner. It's going to spoil your appetite. Here we go, right? How many of us are eating junk food of the earth, and we have lost our taste for what's good? I mean, when I was a kid, we, we drove my parents crazy. They go out to this expensive restaurant, and all we want are the golden arches. I'm not even going to say the name of the place. But, you know, the other several weeks ago, I, not several weeks, several years ago, I haven't gone in a while, I decided to go to that place. And if you are owner of that place, God bless you. I love, you know, whatever, just move on, okay? And I had something that's big, and it's a Mac, okay? And I liked it. <laughs> Special sauce. It's it's. It's flipping good, okay? So I ate it. It was uh, 20 minutes later. I thought I was going to die. Because I, my, my body has been trained to like better food because my wife's an amazing cook. A woman's job is to love God with all of her heart. <laughs> I just got canceled by half of you. <laughs> but what happens is your appetite changes. I remember as a kid, and my kids do this, and I'll buy some sugar syrup, get my cap and crunch peanut butter, and I'll eat it, and then I'll count and have dinner. Right? 
So how many times you and I, we eat the junk food of this earth and our appetite changes. We don't like to eat what's good. When someone's an alcoholic, they, can, they can't drink water. So what's happened is, in many ways, our appetites have changed. Instead of hungering for righteousness, we hunger for substitutes. We're eating donuts, which I call do-nots. If you eat donuts all day long, you're gonna be malnutri- malnourished. It's not one of the major four groups, unless it's Krispy Kreme off the conveyor belt, okay? So listen, everybody, if all you're doing is, so what is God saying? I want you to hunger and thirst for righteousness. Why? Because you're designed for righteousness. And righteousness is only established in relationship with Christ. And when you're in the right position in Christ, and you have the right position, you have the right practices together, it brings a fulfillment that nothing can take away from you. So what you hunger and thirst for drives your life. Ho! (laughs) Sounds like a rapper. Anyhow. Isaiah 55, 1 and 2. It's funny, isn't it? I mean, they actually say that. Ho, like, hey, whoa, ho. Pay attention, basically. Ho, everyone who thirst, come to the waters. And you who have no money, come to buy and eat. Yes, come buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend money for what is not bread? Why do you... Why? And your wages for what does not satisfy. Look, guys, is that not the case? Running after the American dream, running after happiness, you're going to be the most miserable person in the world if you run after happiness. Happiness is a false god in America. It's a horrific god. Fundamentally, our country's way off base because we think that happiness is the... No, it's not. Wholeness. Holiness is. Why do you spend money? And wages for what does not satisfy. Listen carefully to me. And eat what is good. And let your soul delight itself in abundance. So that's what God would have for us, everybody. He wants us to be satisfied. What parent does not want their child? Why does a mother or father does not want their kids to eat before their meal? Why do they want them to eat good food for? Because they want them to grow strong. God wants the same. But we've been trained in the righteousness of Not of God, but we've been trained in the rottenness of the earthly food. So, you've heard me say this a thousand times, and I'm going to repeat myself again. What you feed leads. Whatever you eat. So what are we eating upon? What are we doing there? So what hunger and thirst for drives your life? What you feed leads. And you know what Jesus says? He said this, he was at the woman at the well, one of the great stories, and she was a, anyhow, to make a long story short, she was not a, what you call a religious person. She had five different husbands, and the one she was with with right now was not her husband, and Jesus was talking to her. She says, I, I, I'm, she says, you a Jew, uh, a man giving me, talking to me, and, and he says, I have water that will satisfy you. She says, give me some of this water. And he was talking about her spirituality, right? God cares more about you than what your current affairs are because he sees you beyond your current circumstances and he sees you in eternity. So this is what Jesus says. He comes back. Then his disciples are coming back to speak to him. And this is what they say. In the meantime, his disciples urged him saying, Rabbi, eat. But he said to them, I have food to eat of which you do not know. Therefore, the disciples said to one another, has he bought? Has anyone um, bought him anything to eat? Jesus said to them, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Jesus says, more important than eating. By the way, he started his ministry fasting 40 days and 40 nights. Why? He knew that the most important thing was to feed on God. More important than your, even your body. That it, your body passes away. He says, you've got to feed on God. God's will is more important, okay? My food is to do the will of God. So, we need to be eating and drinking Jesus. Do you know in the early church, they used to think that Christians were cannibals? That we would eat and drink. They thought, they thought we were cannibals. And that was one of the uh, objections against Christianity at the time. They misunderstood it. But there was a, there was a story of Jesus, and he was teaching, and, and, and he did an amazing job teaching, of course. And what he did after he finished his sermon, he said, okay, we're going to feed the people. And he made them fish and chips. He gave them fish and loaves, and it was amazing. Everyone was completely satisfied. They had 12 baskets afterwards. The people were like, this is the best fish 
the best fish and chips we've ever had. This is incredible. Not only does a guy teach well, but we also have a great cafe in the church with the best food possible, right? So they're like, they're following him around. Jesus, give me what I want. He gives me entertainment and he gives me food. What else could you ask for? So they start following him around. And then Jesus, what Jesus says to them, Jesus answered them and said, Moses, surely I say to you, you seek me not because you saw the signs, but because you ate of the loaves and were satisfied. How many of us are following Jesus because we got that new job that we prayed for, that we got that spouse that we were praying for, or we went to that college we wanted, we got that new job, or I got better. And so thank God, since God healed my mother of cancer, now I'm serving him. What happens if God did not heal your mother of cancer? Would you still follow him? What happens if he didn't get that job? Would you still follow him? You see what I'm saying, everybody? If we focus on these things, this is what Jesus is talking about. And he, the people were seeking him, not because of what who he was, but what he could do for them. The sign of immaturity is using people to get what you want. And make no mistake, my saving grace is, I realize that I want God to be my errand boy. I want God to do what I want him to do, and I know that. There's something inside of me. Maybe I'm the only person here that wants to control God. Am I the only person here? Thank you. There's two of you here. The rest of you are so holy, you shouldn't be in here in church. Start your own church. Most assuredly, I say to you, seek me not because you saw the signs, but because you ate of the loaves and were filled. Do not labor for food which perishes. A career perishes. Yes, even your house and your family they go to heaven hopefully what but for the food which endures to what can you see that everybody which the son of man will give you because God the father has set his seal upon him then they said to him Lord give us this bread always he says I'm the bread that came from heaven he talks about and Jesus said to them I am the bread of life he or she who comes to me shall never hunger. And he who believes in me shall never thirst. But I, I thought the Bible says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst. I didn't, okay, hang on. For my flesh is food indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I in him. What does that simply mean? That means your sustenance. You understand that you must feed on Jesus. You feed on what he did and who he is. And that is the most important element in your life. When you and I understand that truth and live in that truth and abide in that truth, it gives us a satisfaction that this world cannot give us because it's not of this world. It's out of this world. Now check this out. People, you know what Jesus did? People are like, what is he talking about? Eat his flesh, drink his blood. This is what God will often do. God will often offend the mind to reveal your heart. God will often offend your mind to reveal your heart. These people got offended. Why? They didn't like the message. I don't like that church. It's all legalism. Why do you say that? Because I don't want to deal with it. You know, this guy, Jesus, I don't know about him. You know what? He's, mm. Why? Because you will find an offense because you don't want to change. And I don't want to change. See, from that time, check this out, everybody. This is kind of sobering. From that time, many of his who? Went back and walked with him. This is too hard. I can't do it. That's exactly the point. You can't. And I can't. And maybe you're giving up on God because he's not the errand boy you're hoping to become. That's a good place to be. Because he's not called to be your errand boy. He's your savior. He's not saving you for temporary sandcastles that the tide will wash away in a moment and the wind will blow away and some little kid will stamp on. <laughs> he's made you for castles that can never be taken away in a place called eternity. Then Jesus said to the 12, do you also want to go away? But Simon Peter answered to him, and he got this right, everybody, as, we, as John makes his way up. Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. My friends, I, I just, this is not just about salvation. This is about living in a life where you and I are hungering 
and thirsting for righteousness, that we're feeding on Christ, and that what's happened is we are righteous in position. But now our practice is aligning with our position. And when our practice aligns with our position, we become the men and the women we're created to be. And we'll have the greatest effect upon this planet. And one day we can hear him say, well done, good and faithful servant, enter into my joy today. He saves us. We're already saved if you gave life to Christ. But I don't know about you. I want to make a great difference for God. You're already accepted by God. But why not? Have the benefits of that acceptance. Why not have the benefits of the inheritance that's been given to you in Christ Jesus? And by the way, all these things that we're talking about are impossible to do in your own flesh. You and I need the Spirit of God to live this life. We need Jesus. We need the Holy Spirit. And we need the body. In that order. You get that order out of order, you're out of order. How do we change our appetite? Here we go. Acknowledge your appetite is not what it should be. Can I acknowledge to you today my appetite's not what it should be? It isn't. And I'm glad I know that. Do you know that? I want my appetite to become better. We should always be growing in that. Change your menu choice from temporary to eternal. We need to throw away the menu of this world. Put it in the shedder. We need the menu of heaven. The menu of heaven never spoils. It never goes bad. And it's always in abundance. And it satisfies you like nothing else can. Let's get rid of the menu of this earth. And this is important. Okay? You, now you think I'm getting legalistic. I'm not getting legalistic. This is biblical. What you eat first drives your appetite. What you eat first drives your appetite. Listen, everybody. Order matters. Uh, ever hear the word disorder? Disorder. Out of the proper order. If your day is out of order, your day will be out of order. If your life's out of order, it'll be out of order. My friends, what does Jesus tell us to do? In Psalm 63, 1. Oh God, you are my God. Early. <laughs> First, I will what? Seek you. That's like going after, longing for him. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh longs for you. In a dry and thirsty land. Do we not live in a dry and thirsty land? Maybe you have enough success to realize success is not enough. Maybe you realize that no relationship is going to make you happy. Some of you are jumping from girlfriend to girlfriend or marriage to marriage or whatever because you're trying to find someone to satisfy that thirst. No human being can satisfy that thirst. Only God can. No career. No church. You're a dry and thirsty land where there is no water early. Listen, friends, every, I'm not saying you have to spend two hours, but before we look at this horrible device that is wonderful and a curse... Why do I care what J-Lo does? Who she's dating now? I don't care. I could care what the kingdom of God is. This will take you hostage. This will take your brain off of God. I'm not talking about, I'm saying, God, I want to seek you first. God, I give you this day. God, this is your day. I will honor you today. God, I give you this day. Why not give God five minutes every day? First thing you do in the morning, I'm going to put him first. You don't have to have a dissertation or a PhD thesis every morning, but just spend time with the Lord every single day first. Jesus says, seek what? Seek first after you look at your iPhone or Android or Google. No, it doesn't say that. It says what? Seek what? First, the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added to us my friends this is not complicated this is so simple it's insulting isn't it but we struggle with it every day i'm telling you i'm telling you i'm telling you, i want more of this and i just found an amazing prayer by the late aw tozer who died in 1966 and you know sometimes in the non-traditional churches we tend to oh we don't read prayers from other people because that that's religion i this guy this guy penned a cry to God that just speaks what exactly what I think all of us need. 
I'm going to read it to you right now. And this is my prayer. I pray it's your prayer as well. Let me read it to you. Oh God, I have tasted thy goodness. It has both satisfied me and made me thirsty for more. I am painfully conscious of my need for further grace. I am ashamed of my lack of desire. Let's be honest. Come on. Let's, come on, everybody. Let's, can we stop playing religious foolishness? You don't care, and I don't care half the time. Let's be honest. I don't want to read my Bible. I'm going to rather watch the sports game. I don't want to pray. It's boring. I don't want to go to a prayer meeting. I'm going to do something else. Come, let's be honest. Come on, be honest, everybody. Cut it out. Are you so, are you so amazing in Christ that you walk out? No. Let's be honest. All of us, myself included, sometimes I don't care about God. I don't. I want to do it my way. How can you say that? That's my saving grace. I realized that. <laughs> right? I'm ashamed of my lack of desire. Oh God, the triune God, I want to want Thee. I long to be filled with longing. I thirst to be made more thirsty still. Amen? Show me Thy glory, I pray Thee, so that I may know Thee indeed. Begin in mercy a new work of love within me. Say to my soul, rise up, my love, my fair one, and come away. He's quoting the Song of Solomon's. Then give me the grace to rise and follow thee up from this misty lowland where I have wandered so long. Isn't that beautiful? Guys, can you see what we're talking about here? We're not all there. I'm not there. And if you want a church that's there, this is not the church for you. The fact that we're not there means it's a church for you. <laughs> really, think about it. This is not heaven. I pray that you're more hungry for God walking out of here today. I pray it's like watching the Food Channel when you're fasting. We're not going to give you the food, but we want to give you the appetite to put God first in all that you do. Amen? I'm going to ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes. Father, I pray right now in Jesus' name, Lord, we need a new appetite in this place. Oh, God, I need a new appetite, Father. Lord, let us long and thirst for you, God, in a dry and weary land, oh, God. Lord, I pray that you would put a dissatisfaction in us. Lord, that you would make us nauseous for anything that's not of you. Lord, that we'd spit out everything we drink that's not of you, God. Unless we drink from you, unless we eat from you, let us be dissatisfied. God, give us that grace. Let us not get drunk on this world or be a glutton in this world. Lord, change our appetites, God. Lord, we want more of you, God. We want more of you. We thank you that if we're in you, we are rightly positioned in you, God, that we are positioned in righteousness. But Lord, we want our practice to match our position. God, give us a hunger and thirst for righteousness, God. And we will be satisfied. We will be satisfied in Jesus' name. Oh, Lord, pour it upon us in Jesus' name. I'm going to ask John to lead us in a song for a few moments. you want to stand for a moment? This is an old song that I never get tired of. You ever have those songs you never get tired of? Some songs I get sick of. This one, I don't care how much we sing it, it always speaks to me. Because it's a cry of our heart. It's, it's a quote from the psalmist David. It talks about thirsting. Can we make this, listen, let's not just sing this prayer. Can we make it your prayer? Let's sing this as a prayer. I know we're running a little bit late, but sing this as your prayer. As the deer panteth for the water, so my soul longs after thee. You alone are my heart's desire. As a deer pants for water, so our soul would pant for you in Jesus' name. Lord, I pray you'd fill us with you. God, give us that appetite in Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated just for a moment.
Listen, everybody, I want to ask you a question. I like what St. Augustine said in his tremendous book called Confessions. Thy has made us for thyself, O Lord, and our heart is restless until it finds its rest in thee. Have you given your life to Jesus Christ? I'm not talking about coming to church or believing in Christ, but have you handed your life to him? Or are you still calling the shots? Who is the CEO of your life? Today is a day of salvation. I ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes. Let me ask you a question. If, have you ever given your life to Jesus Christ? Or maybe you did and you walked away. Let me just take a quick show of hands. Say, Pastor, include me in that prayer today. I want to give my life to Christ for the first time. Or I want to get back right. I've fallen away. Come on, let's be honest this morning. It's several in the first service. Anyone here today would be honest enough to say that. But raise your hand nice and big high. Okay, let's pray this prayer together in our hearts. Lord Jesus, I believe you're the Son of God. I believe you died on the cross for my sins. I ask you to forgive me of everything I've ever done wrong, both known and unknown. And I choose this day to step down from being in charge of my life. Father, my life is your life. Take it and help me to walk the path that you have for me. Thank you, based upon what you did on the cross. And my confession in you and my belief, I thank you that I am now your child. And I am completely righteous in you, in Jesus' name. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, we believe you became born again. Jesus does not say, say your prayer and then you're good to go. He says, no. He says, come, follow me. This is a community of people, Cornerstone Church, that follow Jesus. There's other churches out there as well. But this is a church where we follow Jesus. If you've made that prayer today, you want to pull that card out of the front pocket. It says right at the bottom there, I'm renewing my commitment or I made a new decision. If you have a prayer concern, you can put it in the back as well. Also, you can take out your cell phone. This is what cell phones are good for. You can actually, um, if you've made a decision for Christ, you can text. Text BELIEVE to 860-499-4888. That's 860-499-4888. And we'll help you with the next steps in Jesus Christ. Amen? Finally, we want to give you an opportunity to give back to Cornerstone Church. Again, you don't have to. You get you give to. You get to. And if you want to help out with Haiti, put Haiti down. We want to buy that thing and, and, and help us kids in the mountains. It's a real need, and it's a real opportunity, and we can see the fruition of it very quickly. So we want to do that. Also, we want to give unto the Lord's work here and our missionaries around the world. And I'm telling you right now, when you realize it's not yours anyhow, it's so free. And so the Bible says, you bring your tithes and your offerings into the my storehouse. So, Father, I pray you bless this offering today. In Jesus' name we pray. Lord, we pray you meet all of our needs, not our greeds, our needs in you. In Jesus' name, amen. There are four different ways you can give. You can text Cornerstone Cheshire to 833-245-5608. You can use our Push Pay app, which you can download. You can go to cornerstonecheshire.com. Also, there are boxes in the back where you can put your prayer requests and also the decision cards today. All right, everybody, we have Growth Track today at 1 o'clock with a good catered lunch and a great teacher talking about what it means to be a leader here at Cornerstone. You'd be surprised. Everyone's called to be a leader. We'd love to have you a part of the team here at Cornerstone. We have our prayer team up front to pray with you after. If you made that decision for Christ, tell one of them or go to the front desk. God bless you. Let me just say a benediction of you. May the Lord give you a hunger He can only satisfy. And may you be satisfied in Him with strength and power. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen and amen. God bless you.